Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, quorum is presence of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Sexual Assault in the Military Part 4, Are We Making Progress, will come to order. So I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman, the Ranking Member, and Mr. Turner of the Subcommittee uh, be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection, that's so ordered. Uh, also, I ask unanimous consent that uh, various members, uh, Representatives Harmon, Slaughter, Davis, Chu, and Spear, should they be able on the schedules to come and participate, they'd be allowed to participate, but in accordance with the committee rules, uh, they will only be allowed to question the witnesses after all official members of the subcommittee have first had their turn. Uh, without objection, so, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee and invited uh, participants be allowed to submit a written statement for the record without objection, so ordered. And I also ask unanimous consent that Ms. Slaughter be allowed to submit that written statement, record, uh, for the record, that statement now when we have it on record without objection, so ordered. So with that business out of the way, uh, again, I welcome everybody uh, to the subcommittee. As you know, it provides a continued oversight in the Department of Defense's response to sexual assault in the military. I think it's an important topic, and I regret that if I sound like I'm rushing through this, it's only because uh, I understand we're going to have voting, votes in a few minutes, a 15-minute vote and two five-minute votes, which may take about a half hour out of us. So we'll get as far along as we can, then we'll break for that half hour with, with our apologies. We'll come back as soon as we can and then proceed. And the reason we have everybody on, on one panel here is that we tried to keep it at two panels, not three. Uh, to get done this afternoon because uh, the main committee went over with Mr. Toyota and company uh, uh, take the main room on that, so we did. So we'll try to uh, be considerate of the fact that you've all uh, got schedules that are busy as well, and we want to take advantage of your time here. It's clear that in any context, uh, sexual assault destroys lives, uh, but sexual assault in the military has additional facets that make it a particular concern to this subcommittee. First, it's the unquestioned duty of this body and the United States government as a whole to protect our military service members. And as I've said many times, the last thing that our men and women in uniform should fear when they put their lives on the line to defend the country is being attacked by one of their own. Uh, second, sexual assaults in the military threaten military readiness in an acute way. Uh, when bonds of trust are broken, when unit cohesion is threatened, and when our soldiers are forced to cope with the heavy emotional and psychological burden of a sexual attack, our armed forces are weakened. It is not only individual service members who are hurt by these crimes, but our military as a whole. This is our fourth hearing on this subject over the last two years. Uh, we don't really want to make this a career, uh, but we do think it's an important area and that there was work to be done and that there was some lag between statutory work that was done and the completion of uh, setting up some of the entities that were going to do oversight. Uh, the focus on oversight has uh, has been on the Department of Defense's Sexual Assault Response and Prevention Office, or SAPRO. It was created to be the single point of accountability and oversight for sexual assault policy within the department, and so we've been carefully monitoring its progress, uh, or in the beginning, the lack thereof, but I'm, I'm happy to say that it's moving now. At our first hearing in July of 2008, we heard from two victims of sexual assault. Ms. Ingrid Torres, a manager for the American Red Cross who was raped while working in Kunsan Air Base in South Korea, told us that the process of investigating and prosecuting the crime was just as traumatizing as the crime itself. Mrs. Mary Lauterbach, whose daughter Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach was murdered at Camp Lejeune after reporting a rape, testified about the warning signs indicating Maria needed protection after reporting the crime that had been missed by the Marines and how her daughter regretted reporting the rape. I note that today we will be hearing testimony from Ms. Lauterbach's attorney, is going to provide us with further insight into the experience he's had with working with the military in the aftermath of the Lance Corporal's death. The traumatic experiences of victims and their firsthand experiences with the military sexual assault response programs provide invaluable oversight and insight into the challenges facing SAPRO, and they highlight the areas that the office needs to better address. During our earlier hearings, we also heard from the Government Accountability Office on its findings and recommendations for SAPRO to improve the training, response, accountability, and oversight of the programs. GAO reported that despite some DOD progress on sexual assault response, significant problems remain that could discourage or prevent some service members from using the program when needed. Today, we welcome GAO back to give us the details of their newest report that's being released today and that follows up on the original recommendations. And today, we'll also hear from a distinguished panel of other experts who will answer the fundamental question of this hearing. Are we making the progress necessary to effectively address the problem of sexual assaults in the military? Along with the GAO, we welcome representatives of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault and the Military Services. 
This congressionally mandated task force just completed a 16-month review of all matters related to sexual assault in the military. The task force report contains extensive recommendations for the Secretary of Defense, the Service Secretary, SAPRO, Congress, and others. Representatives of the Department of Defense will be on hand to report on related efforts over the last several years, as well as plans for continued efforts to eliminate sexual assaults from our military. Our society must ensure that we do a better job of preventing these terrible crimes, providing care for victims, and ensuring that perpetrators are brought to justice. The military context, where we consciously create a separate society designed to ensure our national defense, only magnifies our obligation to prevent sexual assault. We hope to hear today that the Department of Defense has made significant progress in correcting the problems that we've heard about for the last two years. It should be crystal clear to the Department by now that Congress is having oversight and watching this. We're going to continue to monitor the progress that's being made, although I hope, as I said, not to make this a career. We're hoping we're at that point. We'll be able to turn this over with the guidance of all of the entities that are set up. Uh, this will be able to continue on, have the proper oversight by the oversight, and maybe just by reports back in, we, we may obviate the, the need for any more hearings on this. We all share responsibility to our men and women in uniform to do everything that's necessary to protect them from these crimes. So we continue that work today. We'll continue it as necessary into the future. And again, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here to offer us assistance on that. And at this point in time, I'd defer to Mr. Flake for his opening comments. I thank the Chairman. And because of votes, I won't uh, take long. I'll submit this uh, statement for the record, but just to welcome you all here. I uh, joined the subcommittee after the first series of hearings were held, and so this is my first exposure to it. And so I look forward to learning from all of you on, on both panels, and I thank the Chairman. I don't see uh, Mr. Turner here just yet, so we'll read for his uh, statement when he arrives on that. Uh, this is a longstanding uh, practice of this committee to swear in witnesses, so I ask that all of the people who will be uh, testifying uh, to stand, please, and, and raise your hand. And I understand some people, um, do, I see in the back there from the Jaguar on that. <laughs> so um, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record please reflect that all of the witnesses are answered in the affirmative. And now I'll just identify the members of the panel before we get started so uh, we get that done at least before the interruption here. Ms. Brenda Farrell is the Director of the Defense Capabilities and Management in the Government Accountability Office. In that capacity, she is responsible for military and civilian personnel issues, including related medical readiness issues. She previously served as an acting director for the GAO's Strategic Issues Team and holds a BA from the University of Louisville and an MS from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Mr. Randolph Height is the Director of Information Technology Architecture and Systems Issues in the Government Accountability Office. In that capacity, he's responsible for auditing GAO's IT work at the Departments of Defense, State, Homeland Security, and Justice. Mr. Hyde has also examined the work that D the Department of Defense has done on the congressionally mandated Defense Sexual Assault Incident Database. He holds a BBA from James Madison University. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Ms. Farrell will do the testimony for both, but both are available for questioning on that. Uh, Dr. Louis uh, Iacello currently serves as co-chairman of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in the Military Services. He's a retired Rear Admiral in the United States Navy, having served for 25 years in a number of distinguished positions. That's job security, I take it, on that. From 2003 until his retirement in 2006, Dr. Iacello served as the Chief of Naval Chaplains. He holds a Ph.D. from Salva Regina University. Uh, Brigadier General Sharon Dunbar serves in the United States Air Force and also as a member of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in the Military Services. She currently serves as the Director of Force Management Policy and is the Deputy Chief of Staff of Manpower, Personnel, and Services at the United States Air Force Headquarters. General Dunbar previously served as a member of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Harassment and Violence at the Military Service Academies. She holds a BS from the United States Air Force Academy, and my understanding is that you'll be splitting your testimony half and half. Is that correct? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kay Whitley uh, currently serves as the Director of Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, or SAPRO, in that capacity, she develops policy and programs to improve sexual assault prevention efforts, enhance victim support, and increase offender accountability. Dr. Whitley previously served as the Senior Director of Communication in DOD's Defense Prisoner of War and Missing Personnel Office. She holds a Ph.D. from the George Washington University. And, uh, Doctor, this is a return visit for you. Thank you for joining us. Ms. Mil Gail McGinn is the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Plans, a position that she's held since 2002. 
In that capacity, she was responsible for developing integrated evaluation processes to measure the success of personnel programs. Ms. McGinn previously served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Force Management Policy and as the Principal Director for Personnel Support, Families, and Education. Ms. McGinn holds a BA from Smith College and a Master's in Education from Boston University. So again, thank all of you for uh, joining us here this morning. Having sworn in, everybody will start our testimony and go as far as we can. Usually when the sound goes off, as most of you know, uh, we still have about 15 minutes before we have to vote, so we'll let it go a little bit over on that and then break. And so, uh, Ms. Farrell, if you'd be kind enough. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity for Mr. Height and me to be here today to discuss our work to evaluate DOD and the Coast Guard's oversight and implementation of their respective sexual assault prevention and response programs. Our written statement summarizes the findings of a report that we are issuing concurrently with today's hearing, and it builds upon our previous work related to sexual assault in the military services. This is the third time you have asked GAO to testify on this important subject, and your ongoing attention to this subject has significantly contributed to the broader congressional efforts to raise the awareness of and the accountability for sexual assault in the military services. Our main message today is that DOD and the Coast Guard have taken a number of positive steps to increase program awareness and to improve their prevention and response to occurrences of sexual assault, but additional actions are needed to strengthen their program. Sexual assault is a crime with far-reaching negative impact on the military services in that it undermines core values degrades mission readiness and esprit de corps, subverts strategic goodwill, and raises financial costs. Since we reported on the implications in 2008, DOD reported nearly 3,000 alleged sexual assault cases. It remains impossible to accurately analyze trends or draw conclusions from this data because DOD and the Coast Guard have not yet standardized their reporting requirements. Our written statement is divided into three parts. The first addresses the steps that DOD has taken to implement our August 2008 recommendations regarding the oversight and implementation of its programs. To its credit, DOD has implemented four of the nine recommendations in that report. For example, DOD evaluated department program guidance for joint and deployed environments, and it evaluated factors that may hinder access to health care following a sexual assault incident but DOD's actions to address the other five recommendations reflect less progress. For example, a key recommendation was that DOD develop an oversight framework, which they have. However, we found that the draft framework lacks key elements needed for effective strategic planning and successful implementation, such as criteria for measuring progress to facilitate program evaluation and identify areas that may need improvement. The second part of our statement addresses the steps DOD has taken and still needs to take to establish a centralized sexual assault incident database. DOD did not meet the legislative requirement to establish the database by last month, and it is unclear when the database will be established because DOD does not yet have a reliable schedule to guide its efforts. Also, system acquisition best practices associated with successfully acquiring and deploying information technology systems, such as economically justifying the proposed system solution and effectively developing and managing requirements, have largely not been performed. Third, the last part of our statement addresses the steps that the Coast Guard has taken to implement our August 2008 recommendations for further developing its sexual assault prevention and response program. The Coast Guard has partially implemented one of two GAO recommendations and it has not implemented the other. The Coast Guard began assessing its program staff workload in June 2009, which represents progress for staffing key installation level positions, but it has not addressed our recommendations to develop an oversight framework. In summary, Mr. Chairman, while the progress DOD and the Coast Guard have made is noteworthy, their efforts have not fully established sound management frameworks that include a long-term perspective and clear lines of accountability, all of which are needed to withstand the administrative, fiscal, and political pressures that confront federal programs on a daily basis. Further, 
Successful program implementation will require personal involvement of top leadership in order to maintain the long-term focus on and accountability for program objectives. Without such support, DOD and the Coast Guard's programs will not be able to maximize the benefits of their respective initiatives, and they may not be able to affect the change in military culture that is needed to help ensure that their programs are institutionalized. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our opening. Mr. Height and I will be happy to take questions when you're ready. Again, thank you uh, very much. We couldn't have done the work that we've done without uh, GAO's good assistance and help on this. We appreciate it. Uh, doctor, uh, we're calling you doctor, I assume, because that trumps admiral. Okay. Dr. Aisello, please. Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to present the work of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in Military Services. As co-chairs, we're honored to be here to discuss the recommendations and findings of the task force and the staff. Given the fact that our formal statements have been forwarded to you, we will keep these opening comments short and brief. As regards our authority, Congress directed the task force in its 2005 Defense Authorization Act, and it was established by the Secretary of Defense in August of 2008. The task force employed an extensive methodology employing both quantitative and qualitative measures. Over a period of 15 months, we visited 60 installations, CONUS, OCONUS, and in the AOR, interviewing 3,500 individuals, 61 victims, senior military and civilian Department of Defense leadership, sexual assault response coordinators and their supervisors, victim advocates, first responders, medical personnel, legal personnel, pastoral care providers, the chaplains, military police, the Department of Defense's criminal investigative services. We've reviewed hundreds of their criminal investigative reports, as well as all prior reports on sexual assault leading up to our work. And at the completion of our work, we submitted the report to the Secretary of Defense on the 1st of December, 2009. The task force focused its work in three distinct yet interrelated areas. That of victim response, prevention and training, and accountability and strategic oversight. First off, the report recognizes the progress made by the Department of Defense in the victim response, in victim response since it inaugurated its sexual assault prevention and response program in 2005. We believe that the recommendations contained in the task force report will significantly improve programs in this critical area. Next, in the area of strategic direction, the task force is recommending that the Deputy Secretary of Defense take responsibility for SAPRO for a period of at least one year and until the Secretary of Defense apprises Congress that this, the SAPRO office is meeting its established goals. We recommend that the SAPRO program be given a more permanent complexion in the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense needs to communicate the message that the SAPRO program is here to stay and illustrate that resolve through designated funding for SAPRA funding in its DOD POM or budget process. The task force recommends that the organizational design, personnel, and mission of the DOD SAPRA office be revised to strategically lead the Department of Defense in this critical area. We recommend the establishment of a uniformed SAPRA terminology and core structure to be implemented across service lines. The task force recommends the professionalization of victim advocates to ensure for qualified personnel with national certification. And we recommend that sexual assault response coordinators are Department of Defense civilians and or uniform personnel in the Department of Defense. The task force recommends the development of program standards and subsequent metrics, which will enable the Department of Defense to more accurately measure the health of the SAPR programs. And finally, in this area of strategic direction, the task force is strongly recommending funding for SAPR research in collaboration with civilian experts throughout our great country, such as those found in the world of academia, our advocacy groups which work so hard in this area, and other federal agencies. And now I'd like to turn the microphone over to General Dunbar. Mr. Chairman and other distinguished members of the subcommittee. Um, as we have submitted the, uh, our statement for record, I'll uh, continue to provide brief remarks. Uh, over the course of our 15 months, uh, there were several trends that emerged. Uh, first is that prevention of sexual assault needs to be the number one priority. 
Um, second, response to victims has uh, demonstrably improved, but more improvements need to be made in that area. There needs to be much greater consistency among the services given deployed operations, joint basing, and other joint operations, as well as uh, greater consistency among the active component and the reserve and guard components. Uh, given the nature of time that we had uh, to conduct our review, we were not able to conduct uh, extensive analysis of uh, what is uh, existing in the guard and reserve components at the uh, unit level or the state level, and so we recommend that the Secretary of Defense undertake additional review in that area. And then as the GAO had indicated, uh, on the uh, data uh, aspect, uh, we really do believe that there needs to be uh, greater uh, consistency, uh, reliability of the data uh, in order for us to be able to do um, trend analysis and be able to continue to improve the program. Uh, finally, we believe that the uh, SAPRO office, while uh, it was initially established with uh, response to victims in mind, needs to be uh, extensively expanded in order to uh, address uh, more effectively prevention uh, as well as the data accountability uh, issues. On the prevention and training area, um, as I mentioned, we believe that uh, prevention is the, uh, the number one priority uh, because that is absolutely key in order to be able to prevent sexual assault from occurring in the first place. Uh, we are advocating that there needs to be a much greater uh, comprehensive strategy. Uh, I think the DOD has done a great job in terms of, uh, of establishing bystander intervention training, but we would uh, state that, um, that the training and, and essentially the, uh, the strategy needs to be much more than bystander intervention to include community awareness, uh, to include the partnership, uh, building partnership capacity with our communities, uh, with academia in addressing the issue. In the training area, uh, we are advocating much more than the rote training that takes place. Um, we would propose that there needs to be training along a continuum that addresses not just the first responders, but those leadership uh, from the commanders as well as the senior enlisted and our civilians, and that that training occur over the course of an individual's career. Um, also, the training needs to be geared towards just generating greater awareness and appreciation for uh, the um, incidence level of sexual assault, debunking many of the myths that continue to prevail, not just within the military, but in society as well, uh, addressing risk um, factors, victim and perpetrator factors, as well as uh, risk mitigation strategies. Uh, we would also advocate uh, specialized and recurring training for uh, those that are um, extensively involved in providing uh, the response to our victims. And then in the victim response area, a couple of key areas that I would address would be uh, that we need to try to provide uh, greater care for the victims. Many of them, uh, as you had indicated, Mr. Chairman, have expressed dismay over the treatment that they receive, um, and I think that much can be done in terms of providing a greater response to them from professionalizing uh, even greater the victim uh, advocates that we have to providing them with legal assistance up front uh, so that they have an uh, they know that they can have a conversation that will provide them with confidentiality to also being able to confide in a peer or a trusted agent as opposed to uh, uh, feeling that their third party then will end up um, being uh, subpoenaed in order to uh, testify against them. And then likewise, uh, we would advocate that the individuals who, um, if they decide that they want to opt out of a, uh, an investigation, that the victims be allowed to do so. And lastly, on the accountability, which GAO has uh, addressed uh, fairly, um, I think, substantially. I won't get into that. Uh, we do believe that there needs to be much greater accountability on the data and uh, that we couldn't uh, emphasize enough the importance of having um, the data system up and running. From the best practices, uh, just to highlight what we believe is important, uh, the common theme there is uh, engaged leadership, increased awareness, and, uh, and the candid discussion that needs to take place at all levels within the DOD. Uh, much of that is taking place from the senior leadership uh, down to the unit level, but again, much more needs to be done. And with that, sir, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you both for your abbreviated testimony. We, uh, Dr. Whitley. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, and members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss the progress the Department of Defense has made in preventing and responding to sexual assault. Since we provided written testimony, I will keep my remarks brief. The reason for our commitment to this issue is clear. Sexual assault levies a human, a tremendous human toll, disrupts lives, and destroys the human spirit. And while we talk about these department-wide efforts, we should always keep in mind that behind each of these numbers, there is an individual whose life has changed forever. Our policies and programs continue to improve, 
and I would like to recognize the collaborative efforts of my DOD colleagues. For example, the strategic plan and oversight framework was the product of hundreds of hours of collaboration. The activities identified in these documents will greatly expand my office's efforts, and to that end, we have already begun to restructure the SAPRO office, and we will grow from seven to 21 employees. We have received more than 100 recommendations from the GAO, the DTF SAMS, and our Inspector General. We were already working on many of these recommendations. However, others are new, and they will strengthen and expand our program. We are working with nationally known experts in the civilian communities and premier civilian organizations and state coalitions to improve our prevention and response efforts. Further, we are members of an interagency group led by the White House Office on Women and Girls to explore ways that all federal agencies can work together to prevent interpersonal violence in society as well as in the military. I'd like to thank my leadership, especially Ms. McGinn and our staffs for their dedication, but we also want to express our appreciation to all of the SAPR staffs around the world, not just in the Pentagon, who work every day on this program, and it is because of their efforts that we have implemented many of the things in our new program. Uh, we believe that we have made great strides in training. Uh, we have to train more than two million service members, and then we have to train a huge cadre of professionals to respond to sexual assault, even sexual assault response coordinators, uh, victim advocates, chaplains, commanders, uh, trial counsel, investigators. So uh, training all of those responders around the world is a big task. Your oversight is key to our progress, and we're all, and also working with the GAO and the members and the staff of the DTF SAMS has been a pleasure because throughout this process, we have all worked very closely together because we all want to make the military a better place for those who serve to keep us safe. Our task is daunting. We recruit from a society where sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes. And we do understand that there's more to do, and we will welcome your continued attention and oversight. So thank you for your support. Thank you, Doctor. Ms. McGinn. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, um, other members of the subcommittee, I too thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department's progress in addressing the crime of sexual assault. I also submitted a long record for uh, testimony for the record, so this will be very brief. But the answer, I think, to the question posed by this hearing, are we making progress, is yes. We are making progress, but we are certainly not at the finish line. We won't be at the finish line until we have eliminated sexual assault in the armed forces. In 2008, we had over 2,900 reported assaults, and we know from survey results that this is only a portion of those uh, that reportedly occurred. Only about 20% of service members who experience unwanted sexual contact report the matter to a military authority. So indeed, we need a strong prevention strategy, an effective training strategy, and potent measures to ensure that we're heading in the right direction. I understand that some of this is uncharted territory. Thus, we want to work with the right experts and in concert with the military departments to advance our knowledge as we go forward. I was pleased to see that the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault and the Military Services emphasized service culture. For indeed, we need a culture that extends the concept of watching out for your buddy in danger on the battlefield to watching out for your buddy in danger of sexual assault. This was the theme of our last prevention strategy and one that we need to constantly emphasize. But we have made progress. In 2005, when we established the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, we believed we needed a small policy office to formalize instructions we had issued, identify new policy concerns, and address them, and evaluate implementation kind of a standard policy model for us. Over the ensuing years, in conversations with the Congress, with this committee, with the GAO, and the task force, it became clear that the office needed to expand its mission and thus become more robust. Dr. Whitley, who you just heard from, has done a great job managing that expansion with advancements coming in investigator and trial counsel training, the development of our correct congressionally directed database, initiation of the first department-wide prevention effort, and development of a strategic plan and oversight framework. Indeed, we welcome the reports of the task force and the GAO as we continue to refine our approach and determine further steps. Today, leadership support of our efforts has never been stronger. It begins with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and continues with dedicated efforts of our service secretaries and senior military leadership. 
The military departments are making every effort to ensure that every service member knows that sexual assault is unacceptable and to ensure that there is help for victims as they need it. Just last week, we welcomed our new Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness, Dr. Clifford Stanley, to the department, and he has indicated that he is also determined to advance our efforts in this regard. So in closing, let me thank the committee for your support of this very important program. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank all of you for helping us frame the issue here on that. We are going to take about a 20-minute break uh, for votes and be back at that point in time. Thank you.
understand this, one of the most important reforms is not just customer complaints will listen to, I suppose you've heard of, but the right people in the structure did not hear these complaints. Is that so? At the right level, the level to bring an immediate remedy, those people didn't hear it soon enough, and so the customers weren't heard soon enough.
switch to Toyota very reluctantly because I wanted to buy an American car. And the Americans were not making hybrids almost at all or were so few that I went straight away to Toyota. Why? I didn't ask how much it cost.
Yoda's priority has traditionally been the following. First, safety. Second, quality. And third, volume. I'm going to ask you a question about what seems to be a fourth priority. That is, for me, the most bubbling aspect of this controversy. And that first, fourth quality is secrecy. Um, to get to the heart of my concern about secrecy and the culture of secrecy, um, I would go to the data reporter, otherwise known as black boxes. Now, people in the United States are very familiar with airline black boxes because they know that if that black box is critical information and if you get to it, get to it fast, you can find the cause, you can put, you can not only respond to those who have been hurt, you can put to rest some of the concern as people begin to speculate what indeed caused this and they come up with some kind of wild conclusion. If that black box is critical. Now, other manufacturers understand just how important it is to get to the cause of the accident for all concerned. Make the black box data available to download. I have had a hard time understanding, therefore, given the fact that your competitors make this data downloadable easily. I have had difficulty understanding Toyota invoking proprietary technology that allows only you, Toyota, on the spot to download. Why should we respect your pri proprietary uh, technology any more we respect the proprietary technology of other auto makers, particularly given the safety aspects of this matter and the fact that an accident has already occurred. Why do you not want to clear the air as quickly as possible? On what basis do you invoke some pri 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 uh, proprietary technology interest in your competitors? in the downloading domain. Uh, let me just answer that question uh, first, that yes, we know that the replace thing can capture uh, this uh, information and then the dealer is not really aware of it. Toyota is also making this... Yes, wait a minute. What's a commercially available and when those who General Motors, Ford, Chrysler have this commercially available uh, reason that they just what, what Why don't you have such a reason? So we are um, in a process of making it available, commercially available by uh, probably middle of next year, which is ahead of the uh, law requirement A and B, that this year by April, in two months' time, less than two months' time, we are going to make 100 units of users available uh, at any, any region, any area. The point is that, you know, with the authority also in the past request, we would have it always open. Now, this is the information, the EDR information is the owner's information that with their consent, we can make that information. Yeah, it was available if you were on the spot. I mean, you don't understand why. No, we why. did not hide it at the request of authority, like police request or NISA request or some other government you know, authority request. We have made it open. Once you came as if there was something that was so secret that even you had to be there in order for law enforcement and regulators to, 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 to read it. I, mean, I, I just don't understand the difference. Indeed, let me make sure I understand what your testimony is. Are you saying that the company is redesigning the black box so that it can be reader 
available by law enforcement, by safety investigators, and consumers. Sure. That was very kind of you. I appreciate it. Sorry about that. Thank you all for your patience, forbearance. Uh, Mr. Turner, you had uh, wanted an opportunity to give a brief opening statement, and now might be a good time for that if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank you for your continued focus and, and effort here, and I also want to thank Jane Harmon for her uh, career-long focus on, on this that we've been um, – had, uh, I've had the fortune to work with Jane on a number of issues. Um, the, um, as, as some of you know, my initial interest in this came about by the unfortunate uh, uh, murder of Maria Lauterbach, uh, who was from my community. Uh, that brought to light uh, several issues as to how um, rapes are handled both in the report and in, uh, with the victim. Um, so I have worked with a number of members on issues where we've tried to, fi to find ways to change uh, both laws and to work with DOD on ways that we can enhance the protection to victims and also find ways to um, to provide them additional support. Um, this report, I think, is, is an excellent uh, report for a basis to begin the process of, of looking at additional ways that we can support victims. Um, and, and I want to focus on one aspect of, of um, an item that I know is important to all of you, and that is the issue of culture. Um, <coughs> the um, Almost in every sexual assault hearing, uh, that I go to. I read this provision of an answer that I got as a response to questions that I had submitted concerning Maria Lauterbach. Um, uh, General Kramlich of the U.S. Marine Corps was responding to a series of questions that I had posed with respect to the Maria Lauterbach uh, case um, and a number of statements that were made through DOD and through the Marines that I found troubling. Uh, one of those was that they had indicated that they had no notice that Maria Lauterbach might be at risk because there had been no violence that had been alleged uh, in, uh, in the allegations of what had occurred to her. So I, I wrote uh, the question of, doesn't a rape accusation inherently contain an element of force or threat? And the answer that I got back was in May 2007, uh, when uh, Lauterbach formally made allegations of rape against Lorian. Uh, the command was only made aware of two reported sexual encounters. One sexual encounter characterized as consensual by Lauterbach and the other alleged to be rape. Uh, Lauterbach never alleged any violence or threat of violence in either sexual counter. Now, uh, the reason why I read that in every hearing, because when we have the issue of culture, uh, I would hope that throughout DOD no one would ever write again that any sexual assault could not have 
uh, an allegation of violence or threat of violence because, as we all know, it's inherent in, in, the, uh, in a sexual assault itself. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for bringing uh, the highlight to this and know that we all have a lot of work to do and we appreciate the work that, that you all are undertaking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin the questioning if uh, nobody has any objection to that. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Whitley, back in August of 2008, uh, we had a report from the General Accountability Office which made nine recommendations to improve the Department's sexual assault prevention and response programs. Today's report from the GAO states that you've implemented only four of those recommendations, and two of those four were actually addressed by non-SAPRO task forces. So can you explain to us why some 18 months later, since the, that report comes out, uh, such a small percentage of those nine remaining objectives have been dealt with effectively? We may have actually addressed more since then. I could probably answer the question better if we talk specific recommendations. Um, I know one thing that was of particular interest to you, sir, was the oversight framework and the strategic plan. Um, we have completed that. Uh, as I did take it for your suggestion to Ms. Farrell and give her a briefing on it. They made suggestions. I went back and put their edits and their suggestions. Um, and that has been completed and we've already begun some implementation. We're still waiting for it to be signed out by the new undersecretary. Well, Ms. Farrell, of the five that were unaddressed at all, your recommendations, can you prioritize those for us? Certainly. I would like to focus on the uh, oversight plan. And I, we do appreciate the cooperation that we receive from DOD by sharing the draft framework with us during our review that so that we could see it and analyze it and comment on it. And our rec they should be given credit for laying a foundation for their oversight framework, uh, which is quite a challenge. But that oversight framework, strategic plan, whatever you want to call it, uh, based on our body of work looking at uh, best practices of successful organizations that are results oriented, uh, there are identifiable key elements that you'd want to see in the oversight framework, which we, met, we noted in the August 2008 report. At a minimum, you want clear goals, objectives, milestones, and performance measures. And uh, performance measures are very key for that roadmap. As I mentioned in the opening, uh, performance measures are necessary to gauge where you are as you're headed toward your goal. And to measure and make a course direct change if necessary. And that is one of the key elements that's missing in that oversight framework is, is the performance measurement. Another that uh, we uh, discussed with uh, uh, DOD uh, back in November before we sent the uh, draft report over with the recommendations that we'd like to see is uh, once you have the performance measures, you need strategies of what you're going to do with the results once you get them in order to make those course corrections. Another element we'd like to see is tying the program objectives which with budget priorities, very key, because that will help DOD to support uh, justification for any resources that they need, whether it's personnel or funding. And lastly, there were three documents that DOD provided to us to our, during the review. And Sometimes you'll have one comprehensive strategic plan. Sometimes there's multiple documents. That's fine. We do not take issue with how many documents they have that comprise their strategic framework. But the three documents provided to us were difficult to tell how they did complement each other. Uh, two of the documents had five objectives that did match up. But then the oversight framework that they discussed with us and provided with us that was responding to our recommendation had nine improvement initiatives that we could not correlate back. Uh, so we still, it's not clear to us uh, what that oversight framework that they provided to us, where that fit with the other documents that comprise their strategic planning. Dr. I, I Whitley, is, is that helpful? Is that something you can work with uh, Ms. Farrell and, and sort of correct? Absolutely. We did take the plan back after my meeting with her and we developed a user guide. We also have requirements in the department to have a strategic plan and it would be confusing to someone um, looking at the three documents. We have to align ours with uh, the personnel and readiness plan and the secretary's plan and we also had to go back and refit all of that. Then the oversight framework, we saw that as 
we hung that, if you will, on our strategic plan and saw that as part of our oversight. We see our role as prevention, um, victim care and response, and then our role as system accountability, and that's where we hung this framework. I think now we've made it more user-friendly, and we've also developed measures. One of the things that we talked about at the last hearing, um, our civilian and federal partners all struggle with finding the best measures for sexual assault because as you know, you can't use reports because it's so underreported. So we are looking at ways now to measure prevention and response and we were able to get uh, at least four or five measures in the PNR threat plan. And we're gonna measure awareness, we're gonna measure victim satisfaction and we are developing surveys and, and it's a challenge and there are not very many models out there. Okay. I mean, it seems to me that you have a good working relationship with GAO and I, and I appreciate that and so I, I'm trusting that you'll be able to continue that and, and resolve those issues. I think they provide value added to you and, and a resource for you. So uh, I appreciate that you are working with them and, and being open about it, and we'll expect that those things will be resolved. Ms. McGinn, just before my time is up, um, how are you aligning the resources, the money, uh, to this so people know that you were serious about it and that it's going to get funded appropriately? And two, uh, the general made a good point. Uh, are you going to be able at the, at the uh, Department of Defense to undertake a review of the guard and reserves at the state and um, unit level? We have um, just recently, I think it was last year, established program element codes. Uh, and into those program element codes, the services put, military services put their money that they have dedicated to this program so that we have visibility over it. Um, and that we can see that it's in there and it's not being cut or it's growing or whatever. And I think in FY10 there's about $110 million so far uh, that the services had identified. Um, in addition to that, we have um, succeeded in getting additional funding for the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, um, $20 million, um, to help with our outreach efforts, our oversight efforts, with the development of the database and those kinds of things. So we are, one, we're watching the money, and two, we're actively engaging in the budget process to try to find more money um, where necessary for it. Um, and we absolutely believe we need to look harder at the Garden Reserve. Um, and we're looking at ways that we might do that. We do have a yellow ribbon program, as you know, that works with the Garden Reserve, and we are involving the Garden Reserve in our various oversight uh, committees. So. We, ad we agree with that recommendation. And we'll take action on that. Mr. Blake. Thank you. Uh, Brigadier General Dunbar, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that uh, things were improving, and I, I just wasn't quite clear as to if you're referring to uh, fewer incidents of abuse um, and how would that be measured or the, the plan uh, being implemented, uh, that that is improving in speed, or can you qualify that statement? And maybe I heard it wrong, I, but, yes, but you mentioned something like that. In terms of improving, what I'm referring to is that uh, the program focus, uh, certainly within the services, the leadership attention that is being given to it from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the service secretaries and the service chiefs, um, down to, in some locations, not universally all locations, unit commander involvement in addressing the issue. Uh, from the SAFRO standpoint, I think, you know, since 2005, establishing restrictive reporting, uh, which, um, you know, I think a lot of commanders were very reluctant to embrace. Uh, now many people are seeing that as very good because more victims are coming forward, uh, those victims who wouldn't have come forward had they not had that restricted reporting option. And so I think awareness is growing and appreciation for a lot of the mechanisms, uh, thanks to Congress's oversight and thanks to just the continued emphasis uh, we are having uh, folks come on board, um, people are accepting the fact that sexual assault does occur within the military services and it needs to be addressed. So from a program standpoint, uh, response has increased, uh, you know, even in the prevention area, which we were initially finding lacking, uh, the fact that uh, the DOD SAPRO office is really working the bystander intervention, all the services are addressing that, uh, that is positive progress. But at the same time, you know, one of the concerns that we have is that uh, bystander intervention is not the be-all end-all in terms of a comprehensive prevention strategy and that more needs to be done. So progress, but still more to be done. Can somebody uh, tell me over the past, say, two years, has uh, the uh, reported cases of sexual abuse gone up or down? We've had approximately 3,000 reports each year. And we will be releasing our FY09 report on 15 March, and um, we already know the numbers have gone up slightly. 
We hope we, we want people to report. That's our right. goal. On and that's that's I guess my my next question is uh, certainly the uh, recommendations include you know increased awareness and education, and, and with that comes uh, in reporting requirements or not requirements, but uh, structures that people are more comfortable with. H are they recognizing that, that that part of improvement is getting more people to come forward? Um, are there metrics then to to gauge whether we're improving or not in terms of incidents of sexual abuse, uh, independent of uh, how many are reported? We're developing um, a survey with the Defense Manpower Data Center to, to ask people on a survey if they've experienced unwanted sexual contact and if they've reported. Um, one statistic I do have, since we've had uh, restricted reporting, it was the middle of um, June 2005, we've had over 2,600 people use the restricted option reporting. So that is data that tells me that that's something that we should continue and that uh, that is a good option for us in reducing barriers to reporting. And we are working on other ways to measure the prevalence of sexual assault. Uh, even in society, statistics show us that less than 18 to 20 percent, uh, only about 18 to 20 percent of victims report to an authority, so it's vastly underreported. So what we're doing in our program is we're, we're trying to remove the barriers that keep people from coming forward and uh, to try to build climates of confidence and to reduce stigma. And stigma is also a big, I mean, we want to reduce stigma for um, any type of uh, mental health that people are seeking. Thank you. Mr. Turner, you're recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> after, um, after you all testify, uh, there will be a gentleman who's, who's testifying uh, whose name is Merle Wilberding, who's an attorney uh, who has worked with the Lauterbach family uh, and has worked with my office on some of the legislation that, that we've sponsored um, on issues such as military protective orders, ensuring that they don't expire, and also that um, so local jurisdictions are notified, because actually in, in her case, uh, the local jurisdiction did not know that a military protective order had been, been put in place. And we changed that in legislation with the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, he, um, in addition to representing them, I, I just want to give you one, one fact about his, his legal career. As an Army JAG captain, he was assigned the responsibility to represent the government in the Lieutenant Cali appeal of his conviction in the infamous Mylay massacre. So he has a little bit of information on the inside as it, in addition to, um, to representing this family. And in his testimony, one of the things he's going to highlight is the issue of the victim advocates. And um, he's going to lay out the case of, of really how, how people are, feel um, whether or not that system is, is responsive. And then he has a recommendation that perhaps victim advocates uh, need to uh, establish a line of authority outside the base chain of command. Um, I wondered if you all might comment on that, having looked at the issue through, um, through your task force. Um, I, that's not, uh, not something that you've recommended, but it um, would be interesting to get your thoughts on that. General Dunbar, why don't we start with you? Congressman Turner, one of the things that we did recommend was uh, to provide um, uh, some confidentiality uh, with the victim advocates um, because uh, in the statistics that we saw, approximately 78 percent of, uh, of attorneys who were prosecuting cases uh, had indicated that they would, or in the defense, would uh, subpoena uh, victim advocate records. And so uh, when you know that you have victims who are, uh, who we tell to go to a victim advocate to seek the care. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, know that they're vulnerable to having whatever they disclose uh, be used against them. Um, that is not what we would consider to be uh, providing adequate victim support. We do think that uh, you can establish a system that allows the uh, victim advocates to have that confidentiality and still have them uh, within the, uh, the military structure as opposed to going outside of a, a military reporting chain. Um, so. In answer to your question, we did not explore specifically um, the proposal that you have outlined, um, but we recognize the importance of victim advocates and the care that they provide and realize that we have a deficiency as it currently is set up. Do you have an opinion on that issue, on his recommendation? Well, sir, as I said, I, I do believe that uh, we can cure the issue without having to have the victim advocates report outside the, the chain of command. There are a variety of, um, of options, I think, that exist. Um, anyone else wish to comment on, on the issue of the chain of command? If I could. 
I mean, let's get a sense of the proportion of this. I, I uh, in August 2007, went to the West Los Angeles VA where there is a women's clinic, and I was blown away to hear that 41% of the female veterans they see are victims of military sexual trauma, and 29% were raped. Now, this isn't a scientific survey, but I'm sure those are accurate figures for three years ago in the West LA VA. And generalizing this to the country gets me to the my little soundbite, which is a woman is more likely to be uh, raped in the military than killed by, by a fellow soldier than killed by enemy fire. So my question to you and I, is, shouldn't we be doing more about prevention? I welcome your response, each of you. And specifically, shouldn't we uh, be doing more of what the Army is doing with its I Am Strong campaign by hiring uh, outside uh, investigators and prosecutors to teach a team of 300, I understand, prosecutors in the Army to do a better job of uh, investigating and prosecuting uh, these uh, rapes and assaults so it sends a strong message to people that you cross a red line and uh, e either as a perpetrator or as someone in the chain of command, and you pay a big penalty. Ms. Farrell? Thank you. Uh, I would like to note regarding that first part, our report does note that not only does sexual assault uh, have implications for the individual, but for the family, the friends, the colleagues, the Absolutely. whole community, besides the unique impact, obviously, on the military that we were t discussing earlier. Regarding prevention, shouldn't that be important? I, I believe all three ways. Shouldn't it be more important, well, more emphasized? It should be, it is a prevention, response, and resolution. So I think there has to be emphasis on all three. As you know, uh, after SAPRO was developed and established, rather, uh, the emphasis was really more on response, taking care of the victims was driving. And it's just, I think, in the last year, and of course DOD can speak to this more, where they've gotten more of a handle on the prevention. And that's what we're looking for, again, in the strategy of what are the clear goals of what you're trying to accomplish. And, and by having a very clear goal on prevention and how you're going to get there, maybe we will see this. Actually, the numbers go down. Mr. Chairman, could others just answer my question? I know my time is expiring. Um, thank you always for the support you've given this program, Ms. Harmon. Uh, one of the things I know the Army came out with their I Am Strong campaign, and uh, the department has a DOD-wide strategy. We work very closely with the Center for Disease Control and use their spectrum of prevention, which tells us you have to work the strategy at every level from the individual all the way up to policies and laws and we also work with the National Sexual Violence Resource Center and each of the services in fact the Navy and the Air Force ha each held summits uh, just a few months ago they brought in their highest levels of leadership and I can tell you in talking with some of the generals that were there and the leaders they are all on board and I think we have a very strong prevention campaign and strategy in all of the services now. If I could add, I had noted that uh, there needs to be a greater emphasis on prevention, and uh, having the strategy is great. Uh, the bystander intervention uh, is one facet of it, uh, but it also includes the community awareness and, and physical safety. For instance, when we were over in the AOR, how you actually set up uh, a, a location, where you put the uh, female latrine, uh, where you site the female tents. Um, sometimes we have the cultural issues of this is the way it's always been done before. Uh, likewise, even when you are going through uh, the dormitory or the barracks areas, basic security measures and some of the newer facilities you find uh, that you've got um, the, the video cameras, uh, surveillance cameras uh, that are set up. Um, it is, uh, a lot of it is driven by culture and the more awareness that we have in addressing the issues, uh, the greater you can uh, provide prevention at basic levels. And uh, that the key to all this is leadership involvement. Uh, the senior leadership of the services, no doubt, are all engaged. Uh, as I mentioned, the chairman is engaged. Uh, but that needs to populate down to unit commanders who have to understand that they have to be out front addressing this issue on a regular basis and have candid discussions of the fact that sexual assault is not tolerated. And even those things on a continuum to include sexual harassment, that those behaviors are not uh, going to be accepted within service in the armed forces. But I just add one thing about culture because the military culture is created 
and we take young people off the streets of America and we send them to basic training and we turn them into soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And while it's a more long-term solution, if we look to what we already know in terms of how to create soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, couldn't we also look to how we change attitudes and how we inculcate this as a cultural issue? And I would just like to note, I was reviewing service programs in preparation for this, and I was struck by the fact that the Army um, for their new recruits has now got, um, the new recruits receive sexual assault training uh, during their reception, during the first week of basic training, just prior to their first overnight pass, and upon advanced individual training entrance. So that kind of emphasis, I think, at the basic training uh, level, I think would go a long way for us. Thank you. If I may, uh, you have highlighted what was for us as a task force one of the most critical recommendations that we have a comprehensive prevention strategy, cross-service, that's, that's given a strategic leadership by the Safra office, which has the measurements in there to know whether it's working or not, to give us the granularity to be able to identify trends, to see whether or not it is, in fact, doing what it's supposed to do. But one of the other recommendations which ties into it is the fact that we don't feel the DOD can do this alone. If we're going to develop a truly effective, comprehensive prevention strategy, we need to partner with our national allies in this effort, uh, with academia, with the national alliances against rape and, 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 and crimes against women. We need to partner with these experts throughout the country so that we can move forward with a comprehensive prevention strategy ourselves. Thank you, Simon. Thank all of you. Uh, I think I'm going to give people an opportunity just to ask another question or two if they have it before we let you all go. And, and when you talked about culture, uh, Ms. McGinn, I was thinking what we had uh, listened to at the last hearing was about a connection by one of the witnesses, that a connection between the ban on women in ground combat and sexual assault. Uh, specifically, that witness testified that the ban sends a signal from the top that women are second-class soldiers and thus inferior to male soldiers. And the inferiority perpetuates an antagonistic view of women that helps create a culture that is conducive to sexual assault. Do you want to reflect on that for us, whether, whether you think that's true or not, and what we might do about it if it is? I haven't really given that any thought. I do know that, and I think it was in the last task force report on the academies that the, that, and I guess can correct me, the task force noted that at the academies, the percentage of women that you had um, was made a difference in terms of the attitudes and the way that people were treated. Um, that there needed to be kind of a critical mass of women there. Um, I don't know that the ban necessarily creates an issue for us. I hadn't really thought that through. Can we provide that testimony for you so, so maybe you take a look at it and, and let us know what you think okay, about it at some point fine. in time? And, and I don't want to hit you on fairly, but it struck me when you were saying that it tied in right. on that. Mr. Height, you've been very good to sit there uh, throughout this whole hearing. I, I do want to ask you to weigh in on, on terms of data collection and where you think we're at on that, what needs to be done to make sure we're at the points we need to be. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Um, for any large database like this, it's, it should be viewed as a process. It's, something, it's a journey that you have to uh, walk down. And so I would say at this juncture that uh, the department is at the end of the beginning of the process. There are some things that have been done. Uh, give them credit for that. But there really is a lot that still remains to be done. And uh, while I'm cautiously optimistic going forward, uh, in, in part because the department agreed with the recommendations we laid out, which was things that needed to be done uh, going forward, I do have some doubts. And some of those doubts um, surround uh, what I believe is um, uh, the need for uh, perhaps more staffing in the program office that's devoted to the acquisition uh, and the implementation of this database and to, to make sure that we're not too reliant on contractors to do that work for us. Thank you very much. Uh, then there's finally the, uh, the last question I had on this was uh, priorities uh, for the general and the admiral to address. I, I think you mentioned one of them, prevention. Is there, amongst the many recommendations that you made to improve the prevention and, uh, and response program, is there another priority that you think needs attention right away and, and to a better degree than it's getting now? We've already discussed the, the data. We absolutely uh, believe that the, the database and the tracking for accountability is essential in order to be able to do trend analysis to further address the issue. Uh, without that, uh, we continue to 
um, just kind of chase tails around the table. Great. Mr. Flake, you uh, any questions? I'll just yield my time to Mr. Turner. I know he's been Mr. Turner. On this a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in looking to the report, General uh, Dunbar, you and I spoke about the issue that um, there are a number of recommendations in it that are for congressional action. Uh, as you know, the National Defense Authorization Act will be moving here in the next couple of months. Um, Jim Harmon and I last year got a number of things that were in it. Um, you know, obviously, the report, uh, we can peruse through it and pick out those things that, uh, uh, that are highlighted as congressional action to take action. But I wondered if uh, DOD, in response to the report, had plans on providing us um, the, uh, the legislative direction in some of the areas that, that you're making uh, a, um, a suggestion that Congress take action. Uh, is that on your to-do list, uh, or will you be leaving it to us to go through the report and begin to initiate those items? Congressman Turner, we provided those recommendations to the Department of Defense and the Secretary of Defense, uh, and the military services are looking at that, and uh, they will be providing, Sec Secretary of Defense, I believe on the 1st of March, will be providing uh, the report with his comments. Uh, so we will leave it up to the Department of Defense. The task force, for the most part, has concluded its review uh, in providing the report to the Secretary of Defense. Ms. McGinn, are you aware of, of whether or not, I mean, there, they had some very specific recommendations. When we met in my office, I, I saw the urgency of it and was saying, you know, gosh, we need to, need to get on these. Uh, as you know, the, the bill will be moving in the next couple of months. Are, are you aware of whether or not, um, in, I wouldn't want to miss a whole year uh, that DOD has it on its agenda to get those items to us? If I'm not mistaken, I think in the process right now, we have been working with the military departments, looking at all of the recommendations of the task force and sorting out an overall DOD response <coughs> because not everybody agrees with everything. So our job is to adjudicate that and make a, a consolidated position for the secretary. As we do that, if we see things that need legislative action, um, we can certainly formulate them for legislative action. I the appreciate your commitment on that because it, the um, I, I would – on the ones that you agree with that are in the report, we should move now. Um, and uh, the, uh, rather than our just taking them and, and putting them forward and then waiting for a response, it would be great if we could work together on that. But just to be honest with you, our process might take longer than that, the process, the bureaucratic process and the building. So well, that's we'll the have information I needed to know because if we need to start the process without the DOD, we certainly have the report and, and I can uh, get with uh, right. members, including Jane, to see what items that, that she sees that are important that we might need to move forward. Right. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. Do you have an additional question or two, Your Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does well, I'm I assume to Ms. your committee I'm going member, to Ms. Spear, if, if you're done, and that she's oh. next and final here. Well, if if I would, you got to go yield to you first. If I got to go you now. You have it. Go with it. And okay. I'll go to Spear. Okay. Two things. First, uh, the comment on leadership. Uh, I surely agree. I have spoken personally to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs about speaking out on this issue. Uh, we all know that Don't Ask, Don't Tell has gotten a lot of airtime lately. I personally hope we repeal that policy, but they have spoken out on that issue, and I would just use my, my time to urge them to speak out on, on this very compelling issue. But here's my question. In the, uh, I understand in, in the new GAO report you have findings, for example, that say victims don't seek uh, prosecutions for fear of a humiliating public trial, and you also say that uh, half the women who do not report rape or sexual assault do so for fear of retaliation. There are remedies for these things. For example, you could recommend uh, um, some, some way to close the trial so it would not be publicly humiliating, or you could recommend um, th that, that uh, people uh, have an easier time to uh, seek a base transfer in the case of those who, uh, who worry that they would be uh, retaliated against. That was one of the issues in the Lauterbach problem. Um, why don't you make, why didn't you make those recommendations? I think this is the uh, task force report. I see, Not okay. Excuse me, the, I uh, did GAO confuse GAO it with yours. Report. Defense task force. You folks in the middle, why didn't you make those recommendations? I, I think, uh, Congresswoman, all the, 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 the many areas that we looked at, uh, we uh, we understood the role of leadership. We understood the uh, w w when we went around and we interviewed all the uh, all the commanders and especially the courts martial convening authorities in every place. And if you saw the extensive list of visitations that we did. Yeah. Uh, we looked at whether or not they aggressively addressed 
the issue of sexual assault and how aggressively they prosecuted any sort of uh, concerns with that arose within their commands. And this, this, the feeling that we got as a, as a task force was that the majority, the major majority of commanders and courts martial convening authorities not only take this seriously, but they're out aggressively uh, uh, prosecuting where they can with the advice of counsel. Uh, as far as the safety issues, we have specific recommendations for the safety, uh, the safety of victims, and uh, we we were very very concerned about the way victims were treated once they reported to their command, mm -hmm. and even those that in a restricted way reported to the chaplain or, or someone else. We we as as the general mentioned, we were very concerned about the safety and security issues. We even went to the in, into the into the uh, the barracks and in the dormitories of the Air Force, we went to see about the, the security issues that were there and how were people handled, how were they processed, how were they tended to uh, when, whenever they reported uh, an, an incident of sexual assault. So that was our f part of our focus, a very important part of our focus, and our recommendations, I think, did address some of those issues. Well, let me just conclude, Mr. Chairman, that I, I think the rate of prosecutions lags way behind civil society, and I think there's much more to do, and part of it is a training issue for prosecutors, and again, I think the Army offers the best example for what needs to be done there, and on the safety issue, there are some specific recommendations that I, I think uh, could have been in your report and weren't, uh, for example, facilitating base transfer. Uh, which would encourage a lot of women to come forward who would otherwise be afraid to do so. And, and, and if they did so, in the case of Lauterbach, would, would have a horrible outcome. So I, I just I think there's more to do, and I think it needs to focus around prevention much more than just response, and we would get a lot farther, a lot faster with this epidemic uh, among those who step forward to protect our country and who, in fact, we don't protect well enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity thank you, Ms. to be Hammond. here. Thank you, Ms. We appreciate your interest and concern. The gentleman from California, Ms. Spear, we thank you for your interest and for your leadership on this issue. We're happy you could join us here today. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a, a question to the task force. My understanding is that in 2008 there were 2,265 unrestricted reports that were filed. Of those reports, how many of them um, then were f pursued as full criminal investigations and court martials. Congresswoman, I believe that actually uh, the SAPRO office is better suited because they have the data for that to answer the question. Right. I think we have the report for this. And if there were 2,389 investigations on reports made in this and prior years, and you know we collect data by fiscal year, but certainly if a, an assault occurs in September, for example, that case is not it could be um, would be may not be completed by then. But there were 2,763 subjects. 592 were pending deposition, disposition, 136 subjects were civilians or foreign nationals not subject to the UCMJ, so the commander couldn't take action. There were 129 subjects that were unidentified. Uh, there were 1,074 subjects that had cases that were unsubstantiated, unfounded, lacked sufficient evidence, or involved a victim that recanted or a subject that died. There were 1,339 subjects that were referred by commanders for the following actions. There were 317 referred for courts martial, 247 for non-judicial punishment, and 268 administrative actions or discharges. All right. If, if I understand this correctly, over half of the cases, or just about half of the cases, were not dealt with. You said 1,074 because of lack of evidence or recanting or the like. So half of those, half of those people who had the guts to come forward were dismissed for whatever reasons, correct? And then of the remaining, 
you have 317 that were court martials of that original 2300 figure and 247 that had some kind of um, administrative action taken. So I'm in the service. I know those figures. What's the likelihood of me reporting a second time when of those who had the guts to report end up seeing that half of them are thrown out? Now, I don't know the, the, the circumstances under what, when they were or how they were thrown out, but those numbers are chilling. And if, in fact, there are so many more that go unreported for the very reason that they're concerned about ostracism or uh, retaliation, we've got a bigger problem than one might suspect. Um, well, there's another point that we have six different categories of sexual assault in the UCMJ, from the least egregious, which would be indecent touching, to uh, aggravated assault or rape. So there's a wide variety of sexual assault. It's not just rape. But what you were well, talking wait a second, about. With all due respect, uh -huh. um, unwelcome touching to me is an assault. Mm -hmm. And I think for most women, it would be an assault. So to somehow diminish them because there are, th there are levels of gravity is not really comforting. Uh, and well, the commander does have the discretion to uh, award a punishment that he feels, um, that feels fits the crime, if you will. And we do provide synopses in our annual report, which describes each of these cases. And I don't think you will get any of us disagreeing with you. And we know we can do better. And just as Ms. Harmon said, part of her interest um, and her relationship with the former Secretary of the Army, uh, we are looking closer at how to train trial counsel. And we actually just got the funding to train prosecutors and investigators uh, so that we can improve the process. But I, I wanted to comment on something. You used the word chilling, and there is something in the literature called the chilling effect. And if you do send a case to courts martial, and that person gets off. By the time it gets back to the people in the unit or the people in the academy, they think so usually the perception is the victim lied. or um, but, And it, does, it has a tremendous effect when that happens. So I, I would suggest a couple of things. One is there's got to be a way to you know, videotape a victim and change their voice so that they aren't necessarily specifically identifiable. Um, two, um, I think that there should be a zero tolerance policy that is communicated everywhere um, that, and then is reflected in, in what actually takes place. And third, I think there should be some kind of a review of those women who come forward and who make a complaint. There is a court martial. The individual uh, perpetrator is court martialed. What then happens to the victim in their professional career? I'd like to tra see us track them to see what is their life like afterwards. Because if their life is, for all intents and purposes, professionally destroyed, that sends us yet another message of why we're not getting people coming forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our questioning of this panel. I, I just want to take one moment to thank our friends from the General Accountability Office. You've been steadfast and incredibly helpful on this, and I suspect your work isn't done. At some point, we may want you to sort of look at this again for us or whatever, but I, w I just want to thank you for, for the great work that you've done. Uh, Dr. Iacello and uh, General Dunbar, thank you for your service generally to the country or whatever, but for specifically on this task force. Uh, from I understand from your testimony that you think you're done now, and, and you're, is that complete? You complete your responsibilities on this? So I'm sure uh, that you're on to other things or whatever, but we appreciate a great deal of work that you did. We understand the magnitude of it, the time and effort that went into it, and the specificity in your report is incredibly helpful, and I, I really believe that it's going to be looked at and used as a guide uh, to folks going forward. So thank both of you as well. And Dr. Whitley and Ms. McGinn, uh, when this whole series of hearings started, uh, we weren't too favorably disposed towards the department's attitude toward this, and that's nothing personal against Dr. Whitley because I think she had her work impeded. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez and others, I think, were horrible, uh, and I think they did things that they shouldn't have done. I think their attitude wasn't where it should be on this issue. I am impressed uh, with both of you uh, with a sense of responsibility and desire to deal with this. I think we have ways to go, and I think your acknowledgement of that is comforting to us, uh, that you understand exactly what's going on here and that there's work to do, and you seem quite willing to do it and to use the good resources that you've had at your disposal to get it done. I think I can speak for the rest of the committee on this. We appreciate that. 
has not always been the case. It gives us a feeling that as we go forward, we don't have to have hearing after hearing after hearing to see whether or not the Department of Defense takes us seriously uh, on that. So good luck going forward on that. Thank you, everybody, for your work on that. I, I hope that the men and women in the service are somewhat comforted by the fact that you're on it, you're on the case, and you're working on it, and as a group, uh, we'll all take this as a, a joint challenge and move forward. Uh, thank you very much. At this point in time, I want to thank the witnesses on this panel, and we'll now receive testimony from our second panel before us, Mr. Merle Wilberding. Thank you, folks, for allowing Mr. Wilberding to take his seat. General. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Wilberding. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Merle Wilberding is an attorney with the law firm of Coolidge Wall in Dayton, Ohio. He represented Mary Lauterbach after the death of her daughter, Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach. He has previously worked with a number of additional families of victims of military sexual assault. He is also a retired captain in the United States Army, where he served in the Judge Advocate General Corps. Mr. Wilberding brings a, a JD, holds a JD from the University of Notre Dame. So I want to thank you, Mr. Wilberding, for coming here, making your time uh, to be, make yourself available for us and help us. I ask that you please stand. Just raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. So with that, Mr. Wilberding, you have a statement, I understand. Your full statement will be put on the record, of course. But if you could tell us in five minutes generally uh, your points, your high points on that, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tierney, Congressman Blake, and members of the panel. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. I have submitted my written statement, and I'll keep a, give you a short summary right now. I'm Merle Wilberding. I'm an attorney from Dayton, Ohio. During the Vietnam War, I served as a captain in the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps. Since early January of 2008, I have represented Mary Lauterbach, the mother of Marine Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach, who had filed a claim of sexual assault against fellow Marine Corporal Cesar Lorian, only to be murdered six months later and buried in a shallow fire pit in Cesar Lorian's backyard. At a hearing before this subcommittee on July 31, 2008, Mary Lauterbach became the voice of her daughter as she shared the fears and harassment that Maria had endured after she had filed the sexual assault complaint. This afternoon I want to talk about the continuing stream of other victims and their families who have reached out to Mary and me. For me it started in the cemetery after Maria's funeral. I was approached by three or four women, all of whom told me that they had been victims of sexual assault in the military, and all of whom told me that their lives had never recovered. As time continued, the stories from other victims continued. In February, we had a call from a mother whose daughter had filed a sexual assault claim against a fellow soldier. My heart went out to her as she said, Maria's story could have been my daughter's story. The only difference between my daughter and Maria Lauterbach is that Maria is dead. In March, we had another call from a mother whose 19-year-old daughter had filed a sexual assault claim against a fellow soldier. 
Instead of receiving protection and programs to help her recover, she was haunted by the ostracism and disbelief of the fellow members of the unit. Meanwhile, the accused was treated with sympathy and deference as the case moved forward. In June, after the NBC Dateline aired a program on Mar Maria Lauterbach's case, we received a telephone call from a mother who had watched the program. Her 20-year-old daughter was a Marine who had just made a sexual assault claim. Now she feared for her life. She had a military victim advocate assigned to her, but the victim advocate told her that there wasn't really anything she could do for her. All of these stories were virtually identical. The complaining victim became isolated and harassed. Their lives were disoriented. The victim became the accused. The accused became the victim. Significantly, all of these victims were no longer effectively contributing to the mission of the military. I want to focus on victim advocates, or as I often call them, victim listeners. In every discussion I have had with victims and victims' families, the victim advocate was described as a very nice person who expressed her concern and understanding, but was not proactive and was not independent and either could not or was not able to do anything. In Maria Lauterbach's case, her victim advocate was her direct report within the chain of command. Consequently, her victim advocate had to think about her own efficiency reports, her own performance reviews, and her own obligations to the command. I have read the report of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in the Military Services. There are recommendations to improve the victim advocate program but I do not believe they go far enough. Victim advocates need, to, need the ability and the training to be more proactive. It is at these most critical times that the victim advocate must act. It is important to remember that these victims are often 18 to 21 years old and at this point very vulnerable, very much alone, and very much incapable of making good decisions. Victim advocates need clear authority to act independent of the command. Congress could, should consider establishing a line of authority for victim advocates that is outside the base chain of command. Are we making progress? I'm at the, the boots of the ground level. What I see is not progress. I've heard the testimony of the panel before and, and the difficulties of making progress and of measuring progress, and I accept their testimony for what it was but I do not think we've done enough. We need to do more. Victims need a better protection system to survive sexual assaults in the military, and the military needs a better victim protection system to protect their own interest in continuing to have a, a supportive and uh, healthy and active uh, military force. And thank you, and I'm open for any questions you have. Thank you, sir, we appreciate that. Uh, why don't we start the question with Mr. Turner, who uh, was kind enough to make sure that your testimony was procured for us here today. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again and also the Ranking Member Flake uh, for uh, allowing Mr. Wilberding to testify um, in, uh, in addition to uh, his work. Obviously, his perspective is, with the Lauterbach family, his perspective is very helpful to us as he has reviewed the report uh, that uh, we had just received. Uh, I'd like to ask you, if I could, to enter into the record a um, um, an op-ed piece that Mr. Wilberning has uh, written, Sexual Assault in the Military, Looking for a Few Good Changes, that has some of the recommendations that he had just... Without objection, so ordered. And um, I uh, wanted to ask Mr. Wilberding, in, in your, did, when you, um, you began to represent the Lauterbach family and the facts began to unfold, um, you had a critical eye and ability to look at um, where, where things went wrong, where the military and DOD did things wrong. Um, and, uh, and I've greatly appreciated that because it's been a, an, a great assistance to me as we've looked to legislation that might be able to address some of the issues. But one thing I find really compelling about the story of your experience since uh, you began working with the Lauterbach family is that others have come to you. And they've come to you with their stories of their experience. Um, why do you think people are, have, are reaching out so and have been contacting you to tell you their stories also? Well, it's been an interesting process in, in the time period now really two years from that. And people have called from all over the country. Uh, the cases I cited here, uh, they were in military bases throughout the country. And each time what was consistent to me was that 
they had nowhere to turn to. They had no, their daughters in every case, uh, uh, could not, did not have any uh, faith and trust in the victim advocate that they were dealing with. They didn't have any faith in the superiors dealing with. They were really struggling. And these are, for the most part, um, hardworking people who didn't have the money to go to the faraway places. In every instance, as their daughter was a very long distance from home. So there wasn't the support system for the daughter uh, from the home that you could have, for example, if a rape occurred in a college atmosphere, there are a lot of other ones. But in the military, it's different. And I think they were reaching out to us primarily because, one, they wanted to tell their story. I thought they, they really wanted to get the story out of the struggles and frustrations they were had. And two, I think they were looking for a support group to have them uh, reassure that, uh, uh, that thing people cared about. I thought that was what I really felt is that they were so alone, their daughters were so alone, and they were getting no support from anyone in the military, and that's what they were reaching out for. Well, your recommendation on the victim advocates in the, um, taking them from the chain of command, how will that allow them to be more proactive, and, and what, would that, well, what would that do to help us in, in the system? Well, I it's an interesting concept, and, and especially in the light of the conversation uh, from the panel, uh, earlier today, I, my initial thought had always been that when the Marines issued their statement on January 15th of 2008, remember that her body was found on Friday, January 11th, and at 3 o'clock the Marines issued a nine-page opening statement, they called it, that listed everything they had done and what struck me about it, and by the way, they read it to us, uh, I was in a conference room with Mary Lauterbeck, they read it to us. Uh, um, literally minutes before they walked in front and read it. So we had no opportunity to see it in advance and we're trying to take notes on it. But what struck me about that nine page opening statement was it was a series of statements as to providing some basis for why they didn't do what they uh, didn't uh, take things seriously, didn't take certain actions, didn't pursue her. Everything seemed to us that it looked like they were given reasons why they didn't do anything and why their guesses at that were, were reasonable guesses. And what struck me is there wasn't anything in there, gee whiz, we could have done more, we should have done more. Uh, it came across with not a mea culpa, but a Maria culpa. It really struck me as they were saying, well, nobody gave us all the hard evidence if you had just told me all that. And they're putting the burden on the on the accused to connect the dots, and there were a lot of red alerts in that. And what struck me about the conference and the panel earlier was that I, when the question was the same asked, why wasn't it in the report? And the response was they talked to the commanders, uh, and I have a good appreciation for that uh, uh, and a good amount of respect for them, great respect for them. When you talk to the commanders, it's like uh, the same situation to my reaction is the same as what I saw here. And it's the same as people in general. When people look at facts, they tend to look at it as reinforcing their own position. When institutions look at facts, they tend to look at the facts reinforcing their own position. So when the Marines looked at the Lauterbach facts, they looked at it in the sense of, well, we did this, we did that, nobody told us about this, nobody told us about that. And that's what I heard, frankly, in my view of the commanding generals. Do we need an independent one? No, we, we're, we're doing a good job ourselves. And I, and I sort of sense that that's, that's how the, that's in part human nature and part institutional nature, but I think it's something to keep in mind as you evaluate those positions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wolverine. Thank you. Well, where would the uh, line of authority lie to best ensure that independence? Well, that's a fair question and, and, a, and a reasonable opportunity as to whether or not there's recognize the suggestion that it should be a DOD employee if, if a civilian or a member of the military if it's a military victim advocate. Um, but I think if they talk about it, and I've been out of the Army for a number of years, but the Defense uh, Council and the military have a, have, a, uh, have a separate chain of command that the prosecutors don't have, and they did that to create some independence in that. And in terms of that, why I think it's important, and, and Maria's case is a good illustration. 
is the Marines gave their statement on January 15, said this is what happened, every fact is true, and nobody told us differently, and we obviously don't have any obligation to pursue it. But in doing that, they uh, didn't really look at uh, what had happened beforehand, and consequently things just fell by the wayside, and they didn't have a independent victim advocate saying, uh, particularly in that period, it, was, it should have been all the time, from May until December. She went missing on December 14th. The victim advocate could have been and should have been doing more things. But from December 14th to January 11th, to me, that's where an independent advocate could have been most helpful. You know, what about this evidence? So Mary Lauderback and some other could have been in contact with her. Found this, found that. Why don't you do more? Yeah, I, I guess I get that aspect of it. I think it's a point well made. But but who to whom would that victim advocate report? I think they would have to create that system within the within the military. And what about the task force recommendation that there would be privileged communications between a, the advocate and the and the victim? Is that a good idea? I think that's a very good recommendation. I read the victim stories in appendix, in appendix F and uh, detailed the stories where uh, defense counsel for the accused had. Uh, essentially taken the depositions, called them as trial. I think that's a very good suggestion. Mr. Flake? Mr. Turner? Sir, I want to thank you for coming all the way to make your suggestions. I appreciate you letting us put your article on the record. I think these are things that will help inform our decisions as we go forward, and particularly with uh, that one idea that certainly needs and warrants to be explored. So uh, our appreciation. Thank you. Uh, with that, the, me the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.